Okay, good. All right, we're on? Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Let me call this meeting of the Health and Human Services Committee to order. Uh, we have a couple of special guests today. Uh, our Attorney General is interested in a couple of bills. Sam Olins, where are you? Back in the back, so. Don't usually think of the Attorney General coming to help, but these are pretty important issues about the pain clinic and elder abuse. So thank you very much for coming. And from the input that we've had from your department, I really appreciate it. Also, I have one of my, uh, somebody from my home county, the one of the assistant DAs, Jesse Evans. Jesse, where are you? There you go, Hello. thank you very much for coming. And uh, so it's always nice to have somebody from Cobb County come down and he will be testifying later. Uh, I don't normally go first, but my vice chair, since I have a bill, has asked that I go first. And so at this point, I am going to turn the committee over to the vice chair. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, for the member of the committees, we're going to do House Bill 1110 first, as presented by a Chairwoman Cooper. Chair Lady, I stand corrected. Uh, whatever, Madam Chairman, Chair. Madam Chair. Everybody's All-American, defending indoor national champion. As long as, <laughs> as long as you just call my name, it's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I bring to you today House Bill 1110. Um, during the campaign season last year, I used to put up a big sign on a couple's yard that was right by one of my major high schools and right on the corner, and went by to ask if I could put the big sign up again, and found um, an elderly woman whose feet were three sizes too big from what turned out to be congestive heart failure, living in a 60-year-old house uh, that her daughter and son-in-law had uh, coerced her basically into signing over to them and said they would take care of us, and it was falling down, and she hadn't seen them in four years and was trying to live on a very minimal Social Security. Uh, it was a mess. So I got, I've always been <laughs> interested in, in the elderly, but that brought up something that had happened to my mother when uh, she had her crisis, and before I could be appointed as the guardian for my mom, uh, one of the caretakers, which she was required to have 24 hours a day, took her through the bank, uh, went through the far teller line, and asked for a counter check to be signed for $5,000, and the bank did it. My mother was in the car. She was like five feet tall in this big SUV. She had never gone through the drive through ever in her life. And they, of course, said, is it okay? And in her confused state, she said yes. Now, of course, it never meant that my mother was going to go without something that she needed. But for a lot of our elderly, it would have meant their major savings and would have kept them from either buying food or drugs. And so this had been a growing concern. In November, I asked to speak with some of the people involved in elder abuse in my county. I came back from a trip expecting to meet with four people. There were 17 people that showed up from the Sheriff's Department to our DA, to people that work in our state uh, elderly abuse division. And they brought forth some of the issues and that are in this bill today. First of all, the bill, we have personal care homes. And these are small ones, uh, usually, that all of a sudden pop up and they do not seek a license. And often there are cases of elder abuse. They take their social security checks and the people do not get adequate care. Until now, and, or until this bill would pass, if that's your decision, if they're found, they have 60 days to go get a license, so there's no punishment. Now, most of the time they just disappear and turn up somewhere else. So DCH had asked that this be corrected, and that is part of the bill. Um, another part of the bill is uh, that we do not do national background checks on people that uh, work in the areas that deal with the elderly. We do Georgia ones. And what they're finding is, is that people who have abused elderly in Alabama or South Carolina or in California move to our state. 
our state background check does not pick up their record and they get a job dealing with the elderly once again and we only find out about their records when they repeat um, their abuse. The other thing that the bill includes is that the GBI does not have permission to go in on a case unless the local law enforcement gives them the authority to come on. And across our state, not frequently, there are areas that, of abuse that are reported to the GBI and where they are not allowed to come in because the, local, the people in the local area know the people that are abusing and protect them. And so this would give the GBI the right to um, investigate elder abuse laws. Um, and lastly, when we met in November, our assistant DA brought up the fact that he felt like, not just him, that our elder abuse laws were too broad and that we were going to have a constitutional challenge. On February the 18th, I got an email from him and we now have a constitutional challenge to our elder abuse law in a murder case and he will be able to speak to it. Basically, the wall was so broad <laughs> that if an elder person fell down in the street and you walked past them and didn't help them, someone could, all, could accuse you of elder abuse. And so this language in the bill tightens that law. So basically, that is what the bill does. And I'll be glad to take any questions. And we do have people that want to speak on the bill who could talk to you about more specifics if you would like to do that. Would you like for them to speak Mr. first, Mr. Uh, Chairman? Or uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. And a little housekeeper, because it's just brought to my attention. I, I just didn't want anybody to leave. We found some keys. So if anybody's lost a set of keys, We've got them here. All right, now that the housekeeping is um, out of the way, we're going to ask the other speakers and then let uh, Madam Chair address any questions you may have at the end that they may come up out of the, the statements made. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Jesse Evans. Hello, I'm Jesse Evans, Deputy Chief Assistant DA in Cobb County, and um, I've been asked to come and speak briefly about um, some of the things that uh, Representative Cooper has shared with you. Um, I'll tell you first of all that prosecuting elder abuse um, cases is a, a challenging thing. They're unusual cases in terms of the types of cases that we in district attorney's offices across the state of Georgia see. Um, oftentimes elder abuse cases go underreported and they are unique in terms of how you have to address the prosecution of the cases. I can tell you from experience that I've um, handled um, um, and currently handling uh, a murder case involving uh, elder abuse. I've also handled a murder case recently involving uh, use of OCGA 30-5-8 as the um, um, underlying felony to predicate a felony um, murder conviction. I believe it's the only case in the state of Georgia where a felony murder uh, conviction was uh, ob obtained using that. So we spoke with Ms. Cooper about some, um, Representative Cooper about some issues, some concerns with her, and uh, I've been asked just to come and, and share some thoughts with you. Any questions for Mr. Evans? Okay. The, the last thing I'll just share with you what I, I shared with Ms. Cooper is that the two important parts of this bill that uh, I would recommend to the committee is that, um, um, first of all, the background checks are uh, extremely important to law enforcement. Um, the, one of the best ways to eliminate these types of cases is having our ability to determine offenders uh, before they're put in these high-risk situations working for the home. So uh, we I come here today in support of that. The other thing that I would like to talk about is a potential problem with OCGA 30-5-8, and um, this bill would cure this potential problem. 30-5-8 um, criminalizes the abuse, neglect, or exploitation of handicapped persons and um, elderly persons. Um, there is no duty of care limitation for neglect in, in the current bill. Uh, we have received not one but two constitutional challenges in Cobb County alone to the, how broad the bill is in terms of um, criminalizing the neglect of 
disabled or handicapped persons if there's no duty of care. So uh, I want to be clear that we're not limiting what's currently in place to a large degree. Uh, it should still be and would still be illegal to uh, abuse um, or exploit a handicapped or um, disabled person. Um, what we are suggesting is that to be safe and avoid a constitutional challenge, some duty of care restrictions should be placed on the neglect of a disabled or abused person. Um, otherwise, the defense would likely come in and say, well, it's broad in how it's written and would apply to a good Samaritan situation where somebody failed to exercise care even where there is no uh, duty to otherwise do so. Those are the recommendations that we've made, and we, we feel that this bill would correct that. Any questions of Mr. Evans? I have one since you since you brought it up. How long, and I know one size doesn't fit all, how long does it normally take to get a background check back? It's relatively quick as long as you've got a GCIC operator. I mean, we run background checks in our office all the time using a law enforcement source code, and we're able to, to get them fairly quickly. It becomes a little more complicated when you have um, um, private companies that have to go through a law enforcement agency, and, and, and I couldn't speak to what the delay would be there, but... It literally, for us in law enforcement, we log on to a, a database, uh, use our secure password, and are able to almost instantly get a, a background check for an individual. It moves fairly quickly. It's all computerized. Thank you. Thank you. Jesse Worthington. Good to have you back. Yes, sir. Good to be back. Um, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. I'd like to thank this, uh, take this time to thank the chairman for agreeing to carry uh, these provisions on behalf of the department. Uh, my name is Jesse Weathington. I represent the Georgia Department of Community Health. I'm the Director of Legislative Affairs. Um, I'll be speaking to Sections 2, 3, and 4 of the bill, uh, which are provisions that uh, the uh, Chairman has graciously agreed to carry for us. Um, these will allow the Department to tighten up on our current enforcement of uh, unlicensed personal care homes. Um, if any of you have had a chance to browse the newspaper, you've probably seen in the past year or so some reports of unlicensed facility issues with uh, severe uh, elder abuse. Um, this would allow the department to go in and uh, put up enforcement uh, proceedings on these unlicensed operators more quickly than we're currently able to do so. That is enacted in Section 3. Um, sections 2 and Sections 4 would allow the Board of Community Health by rule to add to a list of criminal offenses which would currently uh, is set out in statute to disqualify owners, operators, or employees of personal care homes and assisted living facilities. Uh, this would not subtract from that list of criminal offenses, but would allow us to add by rule subject to the Administrative Procedures Act. So, of course, this committee would have oversight over approval of those bills before they're adopted. And uh, I'll leave with that unless any members of the committee any, have questions. Any questions for Mr. Worthington? Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, sir. Kathy Simpson. Thank you for the opportunity to address this bill. My name is Kathy Simpson. I'm the Advocacy Manager for the Alzheimer's Association Georgia Chapter. We represent the 585,000 Georgians and their family members who have Alzheimer's or a related form of dementia. We totally support House Bill 1110. We work closely with licensed personal care homes, providing care to those with Alzheimer's and related dementias, as well as police and fire departments who sometimes share with us the inappropriate living conditions they find in these homes and the inappropriate and sometimes deplorable care. The facility may not be up to code or to standard and may have an environment that is not hygienic. The facility may not be able to meet minimal standards of care for someone with dementia. Or the facility may not have staff trained to manage the behaviors that an individual with dementia may present, especially as it relates to wandering behavior. We also find that oftentimes we get complaints from, parent, from family members who are worried about the care of their family member being subjected to financial abuse. As we train public safety officials to work with us to safely return individuals with dementia who wander, we fr frequently find that personal care home has not appropriately reported a person who's wandered within the 30-minute window allowed by the regulations and thus endangers the individual's health and possibly their life. It's extremely important to us to make sure that the personal care homes are licensed, meet the codes in existence, and to make sure that the people who are, who are caring for individuals in those homes are also appropriately checked to make sure that they can provide the level of care that they advertise themselves to do. Thank you. 
Thank you. Any questions? Very good. A little difficulty reading this name. We'll just say McNeil. Um, let's go with um, Dr. James Boulay. Did I butcher that too bad? That's fine. James Boulay. I have some information for the committee. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak um, on issues of elder abuse, and I was going to give a brief overview. I am the director of the Division of Agent Services in the Department of Human Services, and we administer the Adult Protective Services Program, which is responsible for providing uh, protective services to disabled adults over the age of 18 and older adults over the age of 65. And just give you a real brief overview of kind of the state of elder abuse in Georgia. Um, best case scenario is there's anywhere between 40 to 60,000 older adults that go abused every year in the state. Um, only about 5% is ever reported to any law enforcement agency. That includes our office as well. Um, the Division of Agent Services has been working closely with law enforcement offices across the state to provide some critical training to both increase the number of reports that we receive so we can um, intervene more quickly but also so law enforcement, they have the tools available in order to, to pursue criminal investigations and DAs have the ability to prosecute. We are very pleased to see some legislation being done addressing elder abuse uh, in Georgia and, and want to provide any support um, we can as we move forward. And I want to make myself available to answer any questions that you might have on what it is we're doing in the Division of Aging Services and elder, elder abuse. Thank you so much. Chairman Rogers. Um, I don't have a question for him, but I'll have a question later. Thank you. Any questions from members of the committee? Thank you. You get to do a little pinch hitting. I'm Ann Williams. I'm a, a legislative chair for the Georgia Council on Aging and also chair of the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Advisory Council. And I can say insofar as the Council on Aging is concerned, I'm so pleased that this bill has been brought forward because we really, really need some of this. But in the course of being here and talking to people, and I happen to know uh, very well some uh, an ombudsman from down in South Georgia, and she also is a, an appointed member of the, the Governor's Council on Abuse. And uh, she, uh, I was talking with her, and she said that there was a, a problem that she was dealing with the FBI on, but uh, she didn't, she would like very much to have the GBI investigate some uh, situation that she knows down in South Georgia. And so I, I was able to get in touch with them and they did do some checking on it, and they, they did find that there was probable cause, but at the same time, they did not have the authority without the local people to uh, ask them to come in and investigate, that they could not do it. And this leaves these people in these situations of abuse and neglect uh, without uh, an additional layer of, of assistance that the GBI could do. And so because of that, uh, the long-term care ombudsman requested that the GBI try to get some, uh, that they could do this for the GBI. They couldn't uh, do it on their own, uh, but they did check with the governor on this, and the governor was, was okay with having it brought forward and attached to this bill. We appreciate your concern about this and hope to pass it. Thank you, Ms. Williams, and uh, that's all the speakers we have um, for this particular bill. So, Madam Chair, if you'd like to go out there and answer any questions that the committee may have. Um, the lady that was here from the Alzheimer's Association. Yes, ma'am, thank you so much. I was under the impression, since we're talking about personal care homes, and, and maybe the, the language has changed a little bit, but I was under the impression that what makes someone eligible to go into a personal care home besides the skilled nursing requirement was that they had to be able to recognize danger and get out on their own. Is that still a requirement?
because to me it seems like when we were talking about the personal care aspect that if if they could wander there and the and the guideline was still had to be able to recognize danger get it on their own I, I was trying to marry the two in my mind questions for for madam chair chairman rogers madam chair just on section five the gbi to identifying the best get elder abuse cases uh, do, do we not have district attorneys that can handle this in each county? Well, Is this something that they push back on? or? I think in some counties there's been some problems. Okay. Um, and I think that when they were talking about the county where there was elder abuse and the GBI went down and found out that there really was reason and there was probable cause, but they weren't allowed to come in because they were not invited by the local police and district because they seem, there seemed to be a case where they were protecting the people that were abusing them. Okay. Next question. Who, who calls the GBI? Do you, does the person that's been abused, family, call the GBI? How, how do we make that connection? I think sometimes they do. I don't know whether somebody's from the GBI is here, the Council on. I think Sherry Long's here. Okay. But, uh, from the GBI. My concern is the manpower uh, that they lack is a concern, and we've got DAs that are staffed in 49 judicial circuits. That's the only question Rep I have. Representative so. Rogers, they are in favor of this, so they apparently feel like that they need GBIs in favor yes, of it. GBIs okay. in favor of it, and they did run it by the governor's office. Any other questions for Madam Chair Lady? Madam Chair Lady, I do. You, you said in your comments, and I thought it was a good point, um, about many times personal care homes will just get up and move and go someplace else. So with, with that in mind, and, and I know that to be the case, with that in mind, I, I draw your attention um, to the new language on lines 73 through 76. Okay, I'm going to have to ask if it's okay with the chair for Brian Luby to help me with this. This is the department's wording. Okay. 70 what? 73 through 76. You're, you're signing code section 31-7-12, uh, shall be guilty of a misdemeanor. And, and hey, Brian. How you doing, Mr. Chair? The low-hanging fruit to me is if they're moving, at what point do we not cite them with something other than a misdemeanor? That's a good question. I, I Started off low. I put the misdemeanor language in there. If you want to make it a felony, that well, I mean, I, I, that. It, it, well, no, but we'll be glad to take that. He took me off my game with that comment. <laughs> <laughs> but but it does seem to me that we haven't created the deterrent to the problem that the chairwoman and I know to be just absolutely true, that if they're just going to pack up and, and go someplace else, you know, maybe the second offense should be a felony. I mean, I don't know. I'm thinking outside the box. I'm not a learned attorney like so many others are, but the, um, what, what's your thought on that? The, the, the criminal sanction there is in addition to our authority to impose a civil penalty as well, and that was really what got us interested in this code section. If you look at, uh, let me find where it is here. Uh, line, uh, yeah, line 50 and 51, previously if we found an unlicensed personal care home, before we could find them we had to give them a, uh, a period to seek licensure and we couldn't find them during that period so if they went and sought licensure uh, we couldn't find them um, and what this does is it gets rid of that, that, that grace period if you will for to, to seek licensure and allows us to impose uh, a fine immediately. Um, and we added the, the, the misdemeanor language uh, essentially because I'm most licensed professions that I'm aware of, uh, if, if you're caught operating without a license, it's a, it's a misdemeanor. Madam Chair, what do you think of my thought process? On, on this particular subject. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> my. I didn't want to make it too broad. No. <laughs> I, I, considering what you find in these 
personal care homes that are operating without a license and the deplorable state that you find the elderly in when they are discovered, I'd be glad to have it uh, enlarged to a felony. Or if you want it to be on second. the second offense, that it's a felony, because that's what they do. They close down, you know, and then they pop up somewhere else. So I would be glad if Betsy could write an amendment like that so that on the second offense it becomes a felony. I would, I would appreciate that, and I can tell you there are a lot of elderly that will never be able to tell you thank you, but that they would. I, at the appropriate time, I'd like to hear for any of the attorneys on the committee that if there's a if, if there's something there we don't know about law, but it just makes sense to me if they're just going to go down the street. We've seen this before, that maybe that's that's what we need to do. Uh, let's let's uh, listen to our friend Representative Watson. Do you have a question? Uh, well, I, I just really wanted at the time appropriate to make a motion that we uh, pass. So. Thank you, uh, Representative Henson. I noticed that I think we have a representative from the GBI here. I didn't know if we wanted any comment from them now. Bankhead with the Book of Investigation. Uh, we support uh, the chairman's efforts with this bill. We think it's the best way to go to give the Georgia Bureau of Investigation uh, original jurisdiction to pursue these types of investigations. And so we do support that and uh, in agreement with what our intentions are with respect to allowing us to pursue the investigation. Rep Representative Dobbs. One of those learned attorneys, I think. Sure, but is it possible to prohibit them from popping up again later uh, in another location? Just it, to put something in the bill prohibiting them from going into this, I mean, to creating a new entity at a later time and not being allowed to be in this industry? Representative Dodds, I don't know how we would do that because they don't seek any kind of licensure from the city, from the county. They just go and there's a notorious apartment complex in Cobb County that sort of has five rooms and uh, they go in and bring in five elderly people and or four elderly people and then when they're caught they disappear and then months later they find them in another place. So when you don't have any way, they, they're not seeking any kind of licensure, a business license or anything, I don't know how you would ever stop them, except with the fact that if they do it again, they'll be charged with a felony. I, I don't think there's any other way to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Dobbs. Representative, um, excuse me, Chairman Rogers. Just uh, for my own information, how many unlicensed homes do we have? I, I wouldn't have a clue, so... How many unlicensed uh, assisted? Oh, we, we don't have we don't have any numbers on the unlicensed facilities. I mean, we have several thousand licensed facilities there, but we just have twenty four hundred licensed facilities. So there could be another couple thousand. It could I be a few hundred. It could be a few thousand. I imagine it's more than that. When we get complaints from uh, either residents or law enforcement, uh, that's how we learn about them when we go out and uh, take a look at them. Um, but we don't have the statistics on them because they're not licensed. Okay. Thank you. Representative Pack. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, quick question. I think there was some discussion about in line 73 to 76 to make it a, um, a felony. And I, I question two things. One, in 73, it says that it's declared that the owning of an online says personal care home. But it, it, is it possible that you have people who may own some a home uh, without actually operating it? So it would be somebody else operating it? And is that the intent to capture those people into a felony? Well, my, my, my intent, my recommendation, Madam Chair, on, on, on the language is I if we want to give the proverbial, you know, the, the, the crime has to fit, the, the punishment has to fit the crime, I, I've asked Betsy to just after the word misdemeanor on 76, put in a line and second offense. Um, to give 
a little reasonable doubt in case someone just didn't know the, the licensing process. Right. Would that, would that help in your situation? Um, Please say yes. <laughs> I, I, I would suggest if you're going to do that, either change owning and operating, change or to uh, and, because I can see ownership might be just completely different. Secondly, related to that, Mr. Vice Chairman, on a criminal statute, you generally want to define a mens rea requirement, which is you want to say the knowingly or intentionally operating versus you, you would imagine that it might be something you could negligently operate, seeing that you don't know that you don't ha your license lapsed, something like that. You certainly don't want to capture those kind of people in the felony. W wouldn't that happen if, on my language, on the second part? On the second offense, it would, Mr. Vice Chairman. Thank you. With regard to your first question, an owner is defined in part as one that resides at the facility, has an office at the facility, or has direct access to persons receiving care at the facility. So they're going to have as much access to the residents and present as much of a threat as an administrator or an employee, potentially. And uh, let, let me dovetail on that point, though. And, and you just gave the definition of owner. What would the definition of operator be? Well, because it's, currently, it's currently not defined. Because in some of these group homes, which I want to say start at six residents or less, uh, you, if you've got one person working a day shift and they're the operator, I, I can assure you that some of those people wouldn't know if you had a license or not. Uh, operator is currently not defined. And Betsy, can you look at that and see if there's a better wording for that by chance or how we – Uh, Representative Kaiser. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think this may go to Chairwoman Cooper. But I'm just wondering um, two things. So, and it piggybacks on what you said. What you said, if we don't have definition of op operator, how would this apply to just someone taking care of an elder, where there's elder abuse? And then secondly, when these are investigated and closed down, who's then responsible for those elders who are under that care? Licensure is only required for uh, a facility that's providing care to two or more people that aren't related to the, the person operating the facility and they're providing personal care services, which is a defined term that includes a number of services. Okay. And then when once these are investigated and facilities are closed down, how, who's responsible for that elder, the care of those elders? We usually follow up and make sure that the residents are transferred. They have to notify us where they send the residents to when a facility shut down. They have to notify us where the residents sent to, and then we follow up with the, the facility that they've gone to and make sure that they left. Okay. Um, I know that the Department of Aging Caseworkers, that's where they get called in, and it's oh, okay. they're the ones who then find a place for these elderly to go. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, where we have a real problem and doesn't relate to this bill whatsoever is when people are being taken care of their home in their home, and it's not through an organized thing. It's just one person hiring an elderly person. And the police, I know in Cobb County, will get a call and there is abuse, the caretaker is not doing right, but the person has no family and the police are in a quandary because there's no place for that person to go if they bring somebody bedridden. It's another issue, but it is a problem. But in this case, the caseworker did step in. And I would say to, Re to Representative Pack, in these personal care homes, most of the times the owners are the operators, not always, but if you're owning if you own one of these, you are facilitating poor care of the elderly. You are helping the person who operates it be able to do that. Uh, but like I say, it is usually owner-operated, but even if it isn't, you are facilitating and making possible this poor care of the elderly and working outside our law. Representative Hanson. Thank you. Um, there was a question as to uh, the operator, if it was a different person than the owner, knowing whether or not the place was licensed. If, in fact, you have a license, doesn't it need to be displayed on the wall in a business facility? Therefore, if someone's being paid as an operator, and they're in an operator capacity or managerial, which generally is what an operator would be in, they should also be looking to ensure that, therefore, the licenses are up to date and so forth. And I feel, you know, whether the, the, they, I, I don't have a problem with the second 
offense being a felony because they also have as much knowledge. I mean, if they go through a first one, now, I mean, the owner, uh, the operator should be, have to be cited the first time, too, and it be the same o operator. Okay, thank you. Thank you. As Represent the owner. Representative Kidd. Chairman, and I'm very much supportive of this, and I hate to belabor the question, but it seems to me what we have mentioned here is we're mentioning the owner, we're mentioning the operator, and they say I'm the absentee landlord owner, Mr. Hatchett is the operator, and you are the employee, and you're the one that's slapping around the person who's got Alzheimer's, but yet this doesn't do anything to you. It only addresses the absentee landlord and the operator. Did I read that right? Well. Well, first of all, I would tell you that's assault. That, that'd be my answer to that. It has nothing to do with licensing. What's your responsibility for getting the license? The, the owner or the operator is the individual responsible for getting the license. I, I, I agree. The owner operator should, should the owner operator the owner should be held responsible. The operator should be held responsible, but so should the employee who's the one that's dropping them and beating them around anyway. And you don't take. If they're already licensed, we, we can go in there and, and right. cite the facility if the employees are abusing them and, and, yeah. and notify law enforcement. And with regard to Representative Pack's earlier question about somebody's license lapsing and them not being aware, our licenses don't expire, they're continuing licenses. Uh, when their annual fees are due to be renewed, we notify them, and if they don't pay their annual fees, they'll get a, a demand letter and then a notice of revocation. Uh, before the revocation actually takes place, but it's a continuing license, so the license won't expire without somebody and, and somebody not know about it and get caught up in it. And Representative Kent, I will tell you, most of these are owner operated. They, they're they the ones that are supposed to be taking care of the people, and it would be an assault if somebody else was, you know, ab abusing somebody. There are some other laws that they could go after an individual if it was something different, but most of these places, they do not hire somebody else to work with these people. They pretty much take their money, and the care is minimal, and it's usually done by the owner operator. Any other questions for the chair lady? Great. Um, Betsy, you have any language for us? Anybody want to offer that? Move in a second. All those in favor of the amendment will signify by saying aye. Opposed like sign. What's the pleasure of the committee on, on the amended bill? Representative Chokas do pass. Watson seconds. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Those opposed like sign. Congratulations, Bill passes. Thank you very much, and I want to thank the committee, and like I said, there are a lot of people you will never hear from that are in this situation that really do thank you. Thanks. Next up, we'll just go down through the list. Uh, House Bill 952, Representative Neal, you've had this bill before us, and I believe, did we lose him? Okay, I guess he'll be back. <laughs> all right, uh, going on? Oh, you almost lost your place, Representative Neal. Okay, we have before us uh, House Bill 952. I understand my able vice chairman took uh, um, testimony on this the other day when I had to leave for a committee meeting. And there were suggestions from the committee, and I think that you will see that those have been um, added, many of them, to um, the substitute. Now, are you working off LC 352620S? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. And Madam Chair, I am prepared to, uh, to, to give a statement about the bill, to present the bill, to highlight the the differences from the bill that we talked about Thursday, uh, the, your preference on, on which approach okay. you'd like for me to take. Uh, I think that you could highlight 
the changes that you made, and okay. then take questions from the committee. Okay. Uh, there, there are two changes that um, that we made to this bill uh, from the original. The the original bill uh, referred to opioid analgesic drugs, and we have throughout the the, the bill we have removed analgesic, and we uh, are are simply looking at opioid drugs, uh, and and those. Uh, uh, those strikes took place seven or eight times, I believe, where uh, analgesic was within the bill. Uh, and then also uh, on line 63, we added, nothing in this code section shall be interpreted to require a hospital pharmacy to dispense medications according to brand necessary restrictions or require a hospital pharmacy to utilize tamper-resistant formulations. A hospital pharmacy shall be authorized to dispense medications according to the established drug formula formulary policy of the hospital. Um, and, and Madam Chair, we, uh, that was brought to us uh, by the, the hospital association. We agree that um, uh, within those hospitals, there's uh, uh, no need uh, for, uh, for us to do temper resistant uh, necessary ability of the, the uh, physicians because those um, drugs within the setting of the hospital uh, are dispensed by the um, hospital staff. So we, we have no issue putting that into the, the substitute. For Representative Mills. All right. Uh, Representative Watson. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Chair Lady. Uh, Representative Neal, we discussed, you know, offline the, uh, the aspect of uh, singling out this uh, particular uh, formulation and the TRF necessary that has to be either as a checked box or as a written aspect of that. And I, you know, from my perspective, you know, as a as a physician writing this, you know, if I write a medicine that says X Y Z T R F, and I handwrite on there brand necessary, as is state law now, uh, then that would suffice, and this bill, in, in my opinion, would not be needed. the The other concern I have with it is that to train physicians, I most of us are pretty smart, but I tell you, it's sort of tough to. To, to change old habits, and when we're doing that and making it a specific aspect of that uh, relating to a specific drug classification, I, 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 I think that's going to meet resistance, and I think that's going to be difficult to do. So I, I respectfully uh, will, will disagree with you on this one um, and um, would welcome your comments. Uh, and, and we did have a conversation, and I, and I certainly understand uh, – uh, your perspective. I, I would say that um, uh, if we utilize the existing um, authority of the, the physician to do a brand necessary, um, right now we have, I believe it's seven different temper resistant, and I, I think it's important for the committee to understand we're not talking about a, a brand name, we're talking about a temper resistant technology uh, that is being utilized, I think, by seven uh, uh, medications at this point, and I believe there are uh, there are 10 or 12 that are in the developmental stage, and as we move forward over the next several years, uh, especially with the uh, abuse of opioids at the, the level that it is and, and becoming a greater problem, uh, I think you're going to see a, uh, a continued increase in manufacturers having an interest in putting that tamper-resistant uh, medication out there. And if we, if we move forward with the uh, law as it is now, a physician would have to identify the brand of tamper resistant and, and 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 write that prescription for that brand and put brand necessary and the pharmacist would only be able to prescribe the brand necessary or, or the brand of the tamper resistant that the pharmacist is prescribing and as we see additional tamper resistant um, medications coming available uh, pharmacists would not be able to to just look at tamper resistant and then draw from that pool of tamper resistant that's out there, they would be locked into that one brand that's uh, identified by the, by the physician. Right, and, and I do appreciate that. And, uh, you know, there, the formulations that have been done, you know, over the decades, uh, you know, examples of Procardi XL, which is a laser-driven hole into the, into the drug itself that allows slow release over, over that, and that became actually generic usage. So it's not uncommon for us physicians to write you know, X, Y, Z, and then TRF or, uh, you know, BBB, you know, T 
PRF. That would not be uncommon. That would be the rule and actually not the exception. So when we want to specifically say a drug that is not generic, i.e. the trade name, we will write it out. Now I'll tell you, we're really good at writing it out generally or typing it out or electronic medical records as we do now. We're generally good at selecting that. As a matter of fact, 99% of my prescriptions are through electronic medical records and it's going to be, I'm going to click it, it's going to be that specific drug and then if I have to, to write it out, you know, the brand necessary, print it out, write it out, I will do that, you know, for the patient. But to write out the brand necessary is going to be the easy part for us physicians that are already ingrained to do that. And the formulation where we write the drug out is going to be already in the computer or we'll write it out ourselves. Uh, I'd like to hear from um, Doc. I appreciate it. you know the rest of us who aren't physicians. I, I hear this up here all the time about well we already do it, and my mind always goes to the well if we already do it then what's the downside? Well, it's, it's adding one more burden there. I mean, is, is it necessary? I mean, one of the reasons, one of the th when we came into session here at the very beginning, you know, one of the things I ran on is that we did less laws last year than we had in the previous 10 years. And, and we're on line to do that probably again this year. We're going to pass less laws this year than we did last year. And if it's not necessary, well, then why do it? D do you agree that it's not necessary? Uh, Mr. Chair, I not being a, a learned physician um, I, I I'm, I'm not certain that um, uh, that I understand uh, dr. Watson as he's talking about specific drugs and uh, and and what uh, uh, what you can do I, I do think that I have a basic understanding though that uh, when we're looking at a competitive market and there's the uh, there's the opportunity for in in the coming years for there to be uh, generic tamper resistant that could be available for uh, for pharmacists to draw from uh, that uh, that if uh, physicians are having to specify the brand rather than just doing tamper resistant formulation and uh, and and if uh, uh, if they're able to do TRF now on a prescription and it be a tamper resistant formulation that's something that um, that I have not been uh, no, no one's ever mentioned that to me it didn't come up in the last hearing I've never heard that before this is the first time that I've heard that representative Harden thank you mr. chairman and I'm, I'm not going to do you like I did last time <laughs> uh, chairman Neal but uh, that's why we took yes. you second <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I did mention last time and and to give you an example uh, if dr. Watson writes uh, say one of the glucotrol for diabetes ER which is extended release, then the pharmacist must use extended release glucotrol. There, there's no no choice. And if he doesn't, then that's a that's a misfilled prescription, and, and the pharmacist suffers some penalty. The the one thing that I would so I, I agree with Dr. Watson. This is absolutely unnecessary. It's covered under current law. But one thing that bothers me more, I guess, than anything else, is the fact that on here. It'll, when the prescription is an electronic prescription drug order, you don't have to write brand necessary. Uh, it may be included in the prescription any manner or by any method. Uh, you cannot electronically transmit a class two prescription. So I, I thought I had asked if we could take that out last time. Uh, is I, that? I, I would be okay with an amendment to do that. If All right, and then and another amendment I, we, we need to look at <coughs> in H on line 58, the State Board of Pharmacists shall create a list of OPR drugs including tamper resistant technology. Incorporating? Huh? Incorporating tamper resistant technology. Inclusion of a drug on such drug list shall not require that the drug bear a label purporting to reduce tampering abuse or abuse potential at the time of listing. Now, that would violate FDA regulations, I believe, and, and the State Board of Pharmacy could certainly not 
override FDA regulations. Uh, I, I think, as I mentioned last time, there's only one, one drug that does have uh, tamper-resistant formula uh, at this point in time. So what we would need to do is we'll have to create some way that the state board can every year with the drug update, and you're familiar with that because you've helped us with some drugs on that before. State board cannot put a drug on a list that will create a criminal penalty uh, for violation. So the list would have to be uh, updated each year as a on, the, on the controlled substance drug list. And none of this particular section could be uh, allowed. Uh, that goes on to say opioid drugs are listed as opioid drugs incorporating TRF technology based solely upon evidence submitted by the drug manufacturer. There we're even allowing drug manufacturers to create a list of drugs that will require a criminal penalty if not uh, followed. So mm -hmm. the current law does, it, it's sectioned off so it will allow this. Uh, and I, I just don't see us getting into all these other laws and making changes in order to I qualify it. Representative Harden, if, if I'm, Mr. Chairman, may I? I, I just, I'm trying to wrap my mind yeah. around the okay. point. Mm -hmm. On line 58 between A and list, Representative Harden, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know about the FDA thing, I'm, I'm going to get you to expand on that a little bit more, but having uh, between A and list, if it said a yearly list, would that handle this, your situation? No, because the State Board of Pharmacy still can't create it. Uh, it. It has to be created by the General Assembly. And that's the reason for the annual drug update. Representative Neal, Chairman Neal. Mr. Chairman, I, 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 I want to. I just want to go back just a, a moment, if we could, to our our hearing last week. Conversations that I had prior to the hearing last week with uh, Representative Harden, and uh, and a lot of the testimony of the hearing last week. Uh, there was a lot of testimony last week about how if we adopt this, it's going to create. Uh, cost issues for the patients. It's going to create cost issues for Medicaid, cost issues for state health benefit plan. I'm, I'm having a really hard time wrapping my mind around how that if we have legislation that permits a physician to do t uh, t TFR or uh, TRF, if this le legislation permits physicians to do that, and we're opposing this because of the spike and increase in cost. But today what we're hearing is that they can already do this. I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding how if we pass legislation to allow them to do what they're already doing, it's going to create a tremendous spike in cost if it hasn't created that spike in cost for them to do it without this legislation. The Representative yes. Harden. All right. Thank, thank you, Mr. Remember Chairman. Remember, I picked you second. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, and and I, uh, I, the the reason is, uh, Chairman Neal, we have never. In fact, I don't know whether you remember there were uh, drugs that had a very close uh, therapeutic index, and we have had manufacturers try to list specific drugs in our law to, you know to prevent that, and, and it's strictly just to get a, a position where it's easier for the physician to use that. And, and quite frankly, this would be, right now, I think there's only one drug that could be in this list. And if the physician had to write that drug, then the cost is significantly more than if he wrote a, a generic TRF. So that, that what, was reasonable. What are the previous drugs, if I may, that you're talking about? Well, Synthroid was one. It's got a very narrow therapeutic index. And, uh, and there were several, I believe Digoxin was another one. This, this is a ways back, so I, I can't recall all of them at this time. But I, I do remember the Synthroid, and uh, it is a narrow therapeutic index drug. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but with the doctor being able to write brand necessary, then it's his decision with the patient as to the cost factor. But on I'm Medicaid, then, of course, it's the state's burden. I'm, I'm still having a really hard time, yeah. though, understanding how if they're already able to do this without the law, mm -hmm. and this law simply allows them to do this, how does that spike the cost? And, and, and the argument last week and the argument previously 
has been this is going to be a spike in cost, and the argument now is it's not necessary we can already do it. Well, it's not necessary we can already do it. The spike in cost would come when the drug manufacturer promotes this product saying this is the only one on the list, and so you must write this one. And this particular product that, uh, that we're creating this for is about $600 a hundred, whereas some of the other uh, drugs that have an extended release uh, are in a $6 per hundred range. And, and this bill, again, is a bill that's, that's looking to um, a technology of temper resistance. This is, this is not a, a bill that's looking to, to, to carve out some this. There, there is uh, developmental stages of numerous, there's going to be numerous medications mm -hmm. that will be impacted by this. Right. Chairwoman Cooper. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I mean, I would say uh, to Representative Neal and to Representative Hardin, I mean, we have such a problem with drug abuse, and mm -hmm. especially prescription drug abuse. And I know that we worked very hard, Representative Hardin, on trying to get the prescription monitoring bill through. We're fixing to hear the bill to stop the pain clinics, but it's just another tool. And I, mm -hmm. uh, in talking to People, you know, they say it will probably be a $30 copay, which is reasonable, and I don't think it's going to be um, overly used for everybody, but in cases where there is suspicion on the doctor's part that maybe the patient's not taking their medicine and they're using it, I mean, I think it could be another tool for the physicians to use. And to Dr. Watson, sometimes we pass bills because it is unclear and to send messages uh, and give us more specific tools uh, so that doctors know that they need to do things and are more cognizant, I can't say the word right now, are more aware of the fact that they need to do it. That's just sometimes some things that we do. Uh, Representative I may be wrong. Representative Jurgensen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a couple questions, basically uh, two. In looking at this bill, um, Representative Hardin's hit on, on one of them, sort of, but on, on line 16 through 19, we're, we're defining opioid drug, but isn't it true that we've already defined that? Uh, isn't every drug listed in the Controlled Substance Act? So why, why are we making a new definition and redefining something that we already define in law? Okay, but we do already have a definition. Okay. Okay. Uh, my second question, going back to line 58 through 60, um, Mr. Chairman, why why would you not want to require that it's a? Why would you not want to require that it's a reduced tampering substance on the label? I mean, what, wouldn't you want, isn't that the purpose of the bill is to, to where necessary, we want to encourage these things. So why would you put a clause in here that you won't have to put that on the label if it's included on this list? That doesn't, it's kind of counterintuitive. I don't know the answer to that, Representative. I'll just Re be Representative Neal, that, 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 he's actually flagged something in mind. I'm sitting there going, we want to be able to say we're the only one that does this, but by the way, in case something happens, mm -hmm. for liability purposes, don't necessarily hold us to that. We get the marketing out of it, but potentially not the, the liability. And I don't know if that's, is that, am I hitting the nail on the head there? Okay. What line was that? Uh, it was lines 59 and 60. Inclusion of a drug on such a list shall not require that the drug bear a label purporting to reduce tampering abuse or abuse potential of the, at the time of that listing. And that, that's just completely counterintuitive of what you're trying to accomplish here. 
Yeah, and that, that, that was my thought. I'm sitting there going, if you're going to do the advertising, where the tamper resist, blah, 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 and then later on, and, and we'll let the manufacturer address that perhaps later. Representative uh, Chairwoman Cooper. Representative Harden, in the list that they are talking about, a, a list that's within the pharmacy, it's not a list that's normally out for regular public consumption. I mean, it's not like. If the State Board of Pharmacy creates a list of opioid drugs, then the General Assembly approves that list. It's not the State Board's responsibility, and they would have to uh, they they would have to uh, do have more evidence than a manufacturer's evidence that that it was tamper resistant. And and if it's past FDA, then as this one has, and that would be the evidence. But but it could be added at the annual drug update. Time. Okay, but when they're talking about it being a deterrent to people, you know, maybe getting the drug, what I was asking, and you certainly mm -hmm. know it, yeah. it's that list is something we do, but is not generally used by the public. Yeah, so, I mean, it would not be a, sending a message to uh, people that they, this drug is tamper resistant. It's, it's really for internal use and listing. But, Madam well, Chair, with, with, with all due respect, on line 59 and 60, that the drug bear a label. We're talking about what's on the label of the, con of the drug. That, that's my question. Why are we not, it, it, to the Vice Chairman's point, if, if this is what we're doing, why would, that, why would the law exclude that? Why, why wouldn't you want that to be on the label of the drug? I, I, it just doesn't make sense to me. Representative Harden, do you read that as it, I mean, I'm not reading it that way. Are you reading that label and the one that's going out from the pharmacy? Uh, I'm not reading, no, but I'm reading it as a label that the pharmacist relies upon to uh, determine whether it is tamper resistant. Within and the and if, if the drug label doesn't have that on it, then even if the doctor writes TRF, I'm not sure that the pharmacist is required to to, to use TRF because it, it doesn't, the drug label doesn't say it's tamper resistant. So in your opinion, that needs to be in there just for the, not external use, but for pharmacy use? Uh, it needs to be in there. The, the pharmacist, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I guess, explain, if it does not, the drug label doesn't carry tamper resistant formula, then the pharmacist is not required to use that drug. Okay, but it would be like on the big bottle. Exactly. exactly. Like the big bottle that you so if Dr. From. Watson writes he wants TRF, then the pharmacist wouldn't have to use that particular drug uh, because it's not TRF according to the label. I, I, I really think that, uh, you know, if it's it, the way the law is constructed now, the doctors and the pharmacists understand uh, th what they have to use when the doctor writes what he wants. This just creates some some cloudiness in the law, as far as I, you know, as far as I'm concerned, and that that was my main concern. Representative Kidd. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I may uh, try to, to assist the sponsor a little bit, I hope it don't confuse it, make it even worse. But <laughs> being the chairman of the committee I'm on, I'd like to try to help him if I could. What would be well? Let me drop back. The state of Georgia is one of the few states. They didn't handle the, the federal formulary the way we do. Most states automatically, by reference, uh, adopt the federal formula that comes out every year. Georgia is one of, like, what, three states, maybe four, that have to pass an act every year for all the new drugs that have come on the market between the end of this session and next session. That's the big 30-page thing we have every year that nobody can pronounce the names of the drugs on the, uh, on the pieces of paper. And um, you can hide things in there sometimes, too, if you want to, if you're sly enough to do so. Uh, but uh, uh, that's the Georgia formulary aspect. Well, Georgia handles it differently than every other state. I wonder if we just struck lines 53 through 57. And so the Georgia Board of Pharmacy would be looking at these drugs, and the Georgia Pharmacy would be submitting a list of names of these TRF type drugs to the pharmacists out there and just leaving it at that and then if there's a problem down the road you can address it a little bit differently. I don't know. 
That's just a thought. For, for you to consider while you're getting a few more questions. Okay. Representative Henson. Chairman Neal, you've done a lot of work with regard to the opiates and trying to control the use of them throughout the state of Georgia. Is it disproportionately higher in some parts of the state than the other? The use of the illegal use of and abuse of opiates? Yes. I, I think that would be a fair assessment. And that's up in the northern part, which is more of the area that you represent. We absolutely and have a, a high instance of, of opiate uh, uh, abuse in our area. and. Um, I had a I, I had a, a friend that went through uh, a rehab program. He was uh, addicted to crack. Um, he was in recovery. Had a car accident, broke his back in that car accident. Was prescribed um, opiates and got addicted to the opiates and and um, told me that he was uh, uh, more addicted to opiates than he ever had been to crack, and that he was amazed at how much easier it was to f to buy opiates than it was to buy crack, and. Um, the way he bought his opiates was um, actually um, buying them for senior citizens that were selling their opiates to supplement Social Security. Um, um, obviously, um, we, we know that um, uh, tamper-resistant drugs have only about a third the street value as those that are not tamper-resistant. Um, that in itself could be a, a great deterrent for uh, the amount of um, opiates that are that are diverted into the community when you when you uh, diminish the street value by that much it takes away the incentive for people to uh, to illegally sell those drugs so that, that thank you. that's another thank you representative rogers chairman rogers i'll wave uh, mr chairman come back wave all right at this time the we will entertain any amendments on the bill Mr. Chairman, I move that we amend by striking uh, lines 53 through 57. 53 through 57. Yes, sir. Seeing how I brought it up. This wouldn't require the pharmacist to do anything. It wouldn't require the, the MD to do anything. It would require the Board of Pharmacy mm -hmm. to notify the pharmacist of those type uh, TRF type drugs. Uh, we got we've got a amendment to strike lines 53 through 57. Does the uh, chairman Neal object? I, I would object to that amendment, Mr. Chairman. You, you would object. And do I, we have a second on I that amendment? I appreciate the attempt. Perfectly. We've got a yes. substitute amendment. For this part, according to Betsy, our legal counsel, that maybe the wording was right, wrong on that. And on line 58, she said, if you take the state board of pharmacy, shall identify a list of drugs and then she says if it's just an identify she thinks that the rest of it would be okay that is legal counsel y'all can require the the state board of pharma to actually create the list and then to identify the list would would take that problem out uh, and then they're just uh, listed on the controlled substances act each year as as a uh, representative kid has said so that would 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 solve that particular problem. Uh, All right, we've got. But a I, uh, if I might offer another amendment. Uh, Same way. No, uh, line forty six. All right, just hold that. Hold that just a second. We've got a oh, motion okay. on the floor from the Madam Chair of the Health and Human Services Committee to okay. scratch. Never mind. It's been seconded. Any discussion? In in specific regards to the amendment. Re Representative Henson. On lines 55, um, since when does a pharmacist write in the body of the prescription? Uh, I, I'm uh, just sort of curious, but I always thought the doctor wrote on the body of the prescription. I'm really asking a very serious question. Representative Henson, I'm going to rule that question at this time out of order because it does not go with the, with the, um, the amendment and the discussion we have on the table at this time. Doesn't mean you can't bring it up later. You've got an amendment. Yes, 
Betsy, would you, uh, I'll restate it. On line 58, where the word create is, Madam Chair has scratched create and in place of it put identify. Is that correct, legal counsel? And I believe the rest of the line. And we've got a first and a second. We're in the discussion phase. Hearing no further discussion, all in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Amendment passes. Is there another amendment? In line 46, the starting with when the prescription is an electronic prescription drug, the words brand necessary and not required to be in the practitioner's own handwriting, a, a controlled substance uh, or class two controlled substance cannot be electronically transmitted. So that wording is is basically unnecessary. And and really, I'll, I don't know, Betsy, does that conflict with current law since you, federal law says you can't transmit one electronically? Well, these are all scheduled too. Well, but the bill is only scheduled two drugs, is what I'm saying, so. Can you send them electronically, Rep. Cindy Harden? Not, not class twos. Okay. Not, not this particular okay. drug. I, I think there's some disagreement on whether you can or you can't. Okay. Well, I, I checked that with the Director of Drugs and Narcotics before I came in, so the disagreement can be wherever it is, but that's, that's where that information comes from. All right, l let me, let's, let's get, as we like to say in South Georgia, shuck it down to the cop. Do you have a specific, <laughs> do you have a specific word change or amendment? Yeah, would, would delete line on line 46 beginning with when through the end of line 49. So you would like to scratch on 46 starting with when mm -hmm. all the way till what? To the end of line 49 by any method. No, that's 48. 48. I'm sorry, yeah. It's Opioid drugs. No, but I'm saying if you can get a second reading from that amendment, that would be fine. This is existing law that he's trying to amend. It's not okay. my amendment or not my bill. Yeah, it's not, it's not new language. Uh, th this is not the Controlled Substance Act. Yeah, yeah. But they are all class two drugs. Okay, well, whatever you say uh, on that. That's so are you fine. withdrawing so your amendment? Yeah, that's fine. That's all right, fine. any other amendments? Huh? Representative Jurgensen. <laughs> That, that brings up a very... Uh, Representative Jurgensen, is yes. this an amendment? Well, it, it, it can be because... <laughs> okay. This <All> right. is... <laughs> if, if lines 53 through 60 dealing with Schedule 2 cannot be transmitted electronically, I don't know the answer to that question. I have to take the representative's word. But if that's true, then what we're getting ready to vote on would be in direct conflict. Because, because you're saying that these things can be electronically transmitted, and if that... Betsy? It said in line 46, when, when, the prescription's electron, when the prescription is an electronic prescription, it allows for that for this. Seats all this, and federal law says all class two substances have to be transmitted. All right, we've got. Uh, We've got the bill amended. Any other amendments? Great. At this time, I will entertain a motion on the bill. Amended. We got a we got a first and a second. A bunch of others. Any discussion? I ask the committee to vote uh, in opposition to this. All right. We got one member that is encouraging others to vote in opposition. 
All right, time for a vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Passes as a substitute to House Bill 952 as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Thank committee. You Appreciate it. Okay. 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 okay everybody, stay tuned. We're going to be here for a while. Okay. Fine. All right. Representative Weldon, where are you? After hearing the committee, which one would you, which bill would you like to take first? I just may need a copy of uh, Rule 1069. And they can be handwritten. You want to take the short one first? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, let me see which one. Why can't I get one down in my brain? That would be House Bill 1069. And we would be working off the substitute. If you would give us the correct substitute number, I have LC 334676S. And I, that's, I think that's what I have here. <laughs> to the committee, we're working on LC 334676S. Madam Chair and ladies and gentlemen of the committee, this bill, um, this fixes a little issue that we had last year. Last year we passed a prescription monitoring program bill and included in that language it had uh, a requirement that as you can see here, that security paper be used. And the way that's been uh, understood to mean that it has to be a watermark uh, prescription pad. Um, and what that, that's just caused a lot of problems. We've had a lot, of, a lot of issues with physicians, and I think not only physicians but pharmacists uh, would probably agree that this has not been something that's been beneficial for patients and really the purpose of it is to make sure we have good patient care um, and what this does add is costs which doesn't produce any results um, and what I'm asking for here is that uh, a that a physician can use a prescription pad approved by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services um, and that's on lines 22 and 23 uh, then over on the second page, line 29, uh, take out the word approved, security paper, uh, it'll be approved by the board. Um, it'll meet the requirements as provided uh, in Georgia law, code section 26405. And then also, uh, this is so long, and down in lines 36 and 37, so long as the security paper meets the requirements uh, provided above, then they're not required to have to such a fixed seal. The watermark, the watermark doesn't have to be on there. They can use watermark mm -hmm. and sequentially numbered uh, prescription pads, or they can use whatever's approved by the uh, Medicare and Medicaid services. Question. That's what that bill says. Okay, Representative Weldon, is it not correct that CMS requires the use of their paper with Medicare? Patients fee for service. I believe it's that's a requirement. Uh, yes, which would have been sure. out of compliance with our law. So this brings it into compliance. Exactly. Questions. <laughs> Reps and <Andy> Reiners. <laughs> I can't think of any no. impact it'd have on palliative care. This is all. This, I didn't want, I didn't want any unintended this is all about what a pres what a prescription for a class two drug is written upon. Exactly. Okay. Are there any other? Okay. Who, I don't know who all the people are. Who's? 
That's me. Thank you. I, I'd like to second uh, Representative Rogers' uh, motion. Okay, we have 29. We might have one more question, uh, uh, and I'll take those motions. I second the motion also, but uh, how does uh, – I had numerous practitioners very concerned with not getting the prescription pads on time and so forth this last year and had to write emergency necessary and so forth. How are the practitioners going to be – made aware now that they got to have this pad or they got to have that pad or which pad are they supposed to be using? Because I'm confused how they're going to be confused. Representative Kidd, they already know if they take fee-for-service patients that they have to use the pad by that is that we're doing that by CMS. And I am sure that Representative Hardin, because we're sending out another thing of information for them, will be glad to add this if they can use That's either fine. or. Will you do that, Representative Hardin? Okay. Thank you. All right, we have a motion. That's all the questions. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, we, uh, all those in favor of the passage, uh, the substitute to House Bill 1069, say aye. aye. And those opposed, say no. Uh, the ayes have it. Thank you. And it passes in the substitute. And I want to take this opportunity right now um, I do have a small bill that got left off, and I'm going to put it and replace it of House Bill 1125. I'm not going to present it right now, but I want to thank Representative Hardin. Uh, there was questions about this bill and, and concerns from various people. Representative Hardin and I met for an hour and a half with people on Friday afternoon. Uh, he decided to pull the bill, uh, but I want to put on notice anybody that's from a a PBM here, and for all the people who run our state, um, you know, like AmeriCare and WellCare and all these companies, if you are here, uh, we would like for you to send out a message to your auditors, and I would like to see the message that you send out, uh, telling them that we do not find it acceptable if they are trying to recoup m medicine uh, money from pharmacists when a person unintentionally leaves off a signature, puts it on the fr front or back, and the small clerical arrows like that. And uh, Representative Hardin is going to send something out to the pharmacist, letting them know that they have 30 days to appeal anything. But I personally want to know if this is happening, and I will take it up. And we're going to see if we can handle it that way and come back next year if we have to. Is that cover it pretty much, Representative Hardin? <laughs> well, you had a little bit further to go than I did, so uh, I'm just 19 miles up the road. You're a lot now further from that. Okay. <laughs> What'd you say? Now you're bragging. <laughs> well, I don't know. It takes me an hour and a half to get 19 miles. I could be halfway to Albany or um, down south. Okay, House Bill 972. Everybody sit back. This is a long one. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Ladies and gentlemen uh, of the committee, HB 972, the point of this bill and the purpose of this bill is to uh, give the Medical Composite Board more authority and particularly specific authority to deal with pain management clinics. Mm -hmm. And um, we are, if you'll turn to page 3, beginning in Article 10, actually, excuse me, <coughs> page 10, Article uh, Excuse me, page 3, and that's <coughs> starting in line 68 through 73. What this does is it gives specific authority to the Medical Composite Board to regulate pain management clinics. Then down in section 2, this goes through uh, 4334.280, just uh, denominates this as the Georgia Pain Management Clinic Act, 4334 on line 80, uh, 4334.280. That goes through some of the findings of facts that uh, we're asking you to make here regarding the uh, safety and welfare of uh, Georgians and the control of uh, pain management clinics. Um, and beginning on line uh, 92, this is the definitions portion of this statute 
um, in line 93, we start with annual patient population. And uh, the reason we need to we define that is because we're going to use that as the basis for uh, how we, we identify pain management clinics. <coughs> then moving on down, uh, the chronic pain in line 98 um, means physical pain treated for a period of 90 days or more in a year or shall not include perioperative claim pain, uh, which shall mean pain immediately preceding and immediately following a surgical procedure. Um, going on down through, license means the uh, board of the Georgia Medical Composite Board has licensed these folks, uh, these pain management clinics. Non-terminal condition is defined, pain management clinic uh, is on line 110, or begins on line 110. Um, we, uh, it, we've just defined pain management clinic as being a medical practice advertising treatment of pain or utilizing pain in the name of the clinic or medical practice or clinic with greater than 50% of its annual patient population being treated for chronic pain or non-terminal conditions by the use of Schedule II or three controlled substances. So. The re we're, this is narrowly tailored to Schedule 2 II and 3, and um, it, those are specific drugs set forth in the code, uh, and they're revised from year to year as we come into uh, uh, for, the, for the General Assembly to convene. Um, on Beginning on line uh, 113, after the word substances, there's a period. Then at following that, this uh, provides the, uh, the exception or the, the exclusion of the care providers and, and does not include any clinic or practice owned in whole or in part that's operated by a hospital that's licensed pursuant to Chapter 7 of Title 31 or by health system or ambulatory surgery, surgical center, hospice, or home health agency, which is also licensed pursuant to Chapter 7 of Title 31. So we're, that, that limits, that keeps hospitals out, keeps home health agencies out, keeps home uh, or keeps hospice out um, and the reason we're doing that is because hospitals and these other agencies have to be licensed otherwise and they're having to keep up with making sure that they're doing the right thing with the home with the care they're providing patients um, physician means uh, anybody who's a, a doctor uh, that's on line 18 118 um, Line 126, uh, pay management clinics will be licensed by the board, and they have to uh, come back to the board on a biennial basis. So every two years they come back and renew their license. Uh, and then on line 130, it provides of, of and this is part of uh, OCGA section 4334.283, says that all pay management clinics shall be wholly owned by physicians licensed in the state. Uh, if if a pain management clinic is incorporated, all shares are to be owned by the uh, uh, shall be owned by, and all members uh, shall be physicians licensed in this state. So that's another point. What we the pro part of the problem we're having is we're having these thugs and, and organized crime members from Florida and other states. They're coming here because they're running them out of Florida because they passed legislation to stop them from owning pain management clinics. And it's necessary for us to identify who who should own a pain management clinic. And I, it, it's my belief that only someone who has a legitimate interest in providing good health care should own a pain management clinic. And that's why this is in here. Um, this now this also there's a uh, exclusion in line 134. This subsection does not apply to any pain management. Man pain management clinic in existence on June 30th, 2012. Now, at this point, we have, uh, it's our understanding, we have folks that are PAs or uh, other people licensed to practice uh, under a physician, like <laughs> PA or uh, practical nurse that's working with a physician, and they have an interest in uh, a pain management clinic. Now, it wouldn't be right and I think we already have rules and laws set to stop anyone from owning a pain management clinic that's not a physician. When you have someone who's not trained on that level, t 
telling a physician how to treat a patient because of the master servant or boss uh, employee relationship is a problem there and that problem results in care for the patient which physicians their primary goal the only real goal should be or primary I guess they're gonna they want to make a living too primary goal should be providing good health care and that's that's going to take care of that those folks can continue this will grandfather them in allow them to continue owning the their portion of the pain management management clinic but after that only physicians um, line 140 the board can establish uh, minimum standards for continuing medical education for all physicians uh, uh, that uh, operate pain management clinics then moving on down um, in lines 153 uh, the the board has authority to refuse to uh, renew a pain management clinic license if it determines that it shouldn't um, in 155, uh, line 155 on page 5, uh, no pain management clinic um, shall provide medical services um, as defined by the board uh, unless there's a physician or physician assistant authorized to prescribe controlled substances under an approved job description. So if they're going to if they're going to issue prescriptions and provide medical care where prescriptions going out for schedule two and three drugs then they ha there has to be someone authorized to write that prescription on site now part of the problem we're having right now is that uh, <laughs> is that you know we got these pain management clinics that have you know a, a prescription pad about that thick and they're all stamped or they're signed by some bogus person who's issuing these and they're just coming in one they're coming in one they're coming in this door walking by the person with the hand fistful of prescriptions picking up that and going out the other and it's just nothing but a money mill in addition to a, p a pain a pill mill uh, and that's that's what that's there for The uh, lines uh, 162 through 173, that provides the reasons that uh, a pain management clinic license can be revoked. Um, and that's, we, we're going to have some issues there. We want to uh, modify a couple of these things. And then the re some of the reasons that uh, a pain management clinic can be revoked is for furnishing false or fraudulent information to the Georgia Composite Medical Board or if uh, one of the owners or the physicians have been convicted of crime uh, related to controlled substances um, or if the uh, physician or person issuing the prescriptions has uh, had his or her federal registration to prescribe uh, the controlled substance revoked. Then in coming on down 174, OCGA section 4334-285 requires that it must be uh, reported to the medical composite board if for the, the, the list of eight things. And that's if it's if the pain if the pain management clinic closes, if there's a change of ownership, change of positions, uh, any theft or loss of devices uh, of drugs or devices uh, of a pain management clinic, that type of thing. We want the board part of what this is about is making sure that the board the medical composite board has substantive plenary authority over these pain management clinics um, line 188 uh, OCGA section 4334 uh, they the pain management clinics will have to register with the board of pharmacy um, if you'll go over to page 7 line 205 OCGA section 4334-288 that just provides that a violation uh, of the Pain Management Clinic Act will be uh, if they operate a pain management clinic without a license is a felony and uh, we want to send that message what it's a general felony because it's not listed uh, in here what the uh, alternative 
of what a sentence would be otherwise, and accordingly that would be a one-year to ten-year uh, sentence. Um, coming on down, the last section, section three, beginning of lines 221 through the end of 229. This, uh, and I, there will be a, an amendment that we're going to ask. Uh, I bl believe there will be an amendment, and it's, it will be at the request of the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. And then what it will do is it will authorize the Georgia Bureau of Investigation to uh, send this information to the Medical Composite Board. And we need that specifically in this bill and the law so that they will be able to do that. If they're not authorized to do it, it would, be, it would fall under uh, a confidential document. And I think that covers the bill, Madam Chair. Um, I want to apologize to the committee members for the lateness of some of our bills coming. There are various reasons, but I will tell you that the Attorney General's Office has been very gracious in giving hours of their time uh, through one of their uh, lawyers to perfect this bill, and there was a two-and-a-half-hour or three-hour meeting on Thursday evening with all of the people that are involved in this going over this with a fine-tooth comb. So um, it is a very involved bill, but I'm telling you it has been scrutinized one way and the other, right, Representative Weldon? I certainly agree with that, Madam Chair. So uh, with that, questions? Representative Reiner. Thank you. I've got a couple logistical questions. First of all, what's the need on page three? This is small. Um, line 71, to accept any gifts, grants, donations, or other funds. That didn't bother me, grants or whatever the case may be. But I'm, one, I'm wondering about what your thought process was on forfeited property. Why is that? that line? Uh, you'll find that on line 72. I, I see what you're saying. Why, why is that important that you be able to get someone's property? Well, if someone is convicted of a felony, then and they were using the property at, let's say they had a location where they were operating um, an unlicensed pain management clinic, they're convicted of a felony, the state has the right to pursue that um, and to forfeit the property that was used in the violation of, or, or in the course of the violation of the law. And accordingly, what this does, this allows the uh, well, board this says you can accept it. You can accept the forfeit your property. Okay. Accept gifts, grants, donations, other funds, including funds from the disposition of forfeit of property. That's right. The court could award, could could issue an order that says, "Hey, I'm just trying to figure out why the pain the clinic would need forfeited property." Well, it's my understanding that the pain, or that the medical composite board is going to incur uh, some some expense and cost at for undertaking this legislation and accordingly um, this just allows them to receive funds that are taken this allows them to violated. receive forfeited property I, I think it funds is what it funds from the disposition of forfeited property I don't believe they can receive forfeited property unless they purchase right. it since at it's a proper sale you, you actually gave me a perfect segue and, and and which brings up my second point if you're looking for, because of the expense of doing this, um, of setting up these these clinics, then I bring your attention to line 131 on page 4. All shares shall be owned by, and all members shall be, physicians licensed in this state. Mm -hmm. Now that sounds like to me like an exclusivity clause, because I'm wanting to know as a private investor, not that I have your kind of money, <laughs> but but, but I'd, 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 like, I'd like to know why if, if, if I wanted to donate my property, if I wanted to do this, if I wanted to do that, why you would limit to only physicians can own any shares of this? Okay. I mean, what? And I get the, I get the majority thing for, for the sake of making rules. Okay. From the closure of illegal right. pain clinics, the way it's written. Okay. So if they close down an illegal pain clinic, an illegal clinic, pain clinic, then they can seize the property. That's exactly right. right. Okay. And in the that money from uh, 
the sale of that property or however they do it, then could the board could accept that to help them run this program. Okay, and my second point on the question of why must all members, why am I, I'm just trying to think if I'm Wall Street, you know, I don't know anything about that, but I'm just sitting there trying to say, well, you know what, why don't we make rules that says only this kind of people can benefit from it? If I wanted to share, sell shares in a corporation, why would, why would I want to limit it to just physicians? Because part, the part Wouldn't you like to own shares in it if it was a successful one? <laughs> yes. Well, if I was a physician, I sure would. And I may want to anyway. <laughs> right. That's my I point. I sure Come may on. want to. Right. So give me the logic on that. Okay. Here's the problem we have. We have the thugs and organized crime bosses that have come to Georgia from Florida and other states. They're coming here because they're running them out of uh, Florida, and they won't allow them to own it. it we must have a requirement that if they're going to own a pain management clinic, that they, the person owning it has a legitimate interest in providing patient care. And what I mean by that is they must have, they have, must, they must have walked through the crucible to get that license, and they have some skin yeah, in the game, and they have some walk through the crucible. And we're not drug dealers from Florida, but you're telling me no. That's, I'm, I'm not telling you that, but I'm. T but, <laughs> well, but, but this but bill would tell us no. It, you got to walk through that same crucible that that, that gentleman over to your right has uh, walked through. Okay, and then my final question is: I just want to make sure that I understand. A group of physicians have s established one in County A. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, this board of what's the name of the board? Medical Composite Board. Yeah. So if, if how do you decide if there's enough need for when me and Madam Chairwoman want to come and open up that second one in that same county? Oh, well, that, that's outside the scope of this bill. Right, but, but, how, but the, would the board grant that license, or can I just open it if I meet the, they were, the physician's requirement? They would have to, the board would have to license the other. Could uh, we have six if six yes, different sure physician can. groups? Yes, sure can. And they couldn't, they couldn't reject us if we meet everything because we th if, think there's too many. You, you meet the, the requirements. You, I don't think they could legally uh, no. stop. Is that right, Madam Chair? That's we, correct. We can't limit competition, it, right? No, correct. I think, didn't we discuss a bill where somebody wanted us to license hospices because they started the original hospice and now there's right. six in the same city and, you know, that's, so... <laughs> All the board is just producing license. If a group of physicians meet all, or one physician meets all the requirements, then they can start it up, and I guess if they think there's enough financial gain in it, and they can make it with another one there. And I think back to your original question, if about the shareholders, about the shareholders. if you put them out to a corporation, there would be a move to make profit, and so what Representative Weldon is trying to do is limit this to physicians that are trained in the area of pain management and that they're in the business for patient care. And, they, and of course, if they run them, they do make a profit, but there won't be this big incentive to... I love you, Madam Chair. A lot of physicians, I know. I know I said. <laughs> I said they were in it to make a profit, but not undo right. pressure. Okay. That's it. Okay. I've got questions. Let me go. I've got four questions on the thing now. Kaiser, Representative Kaiser. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I'm, I'm getting scared because I'm starting to follow the train of thought that Representative Reinders has been in today. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope I'm not being redundant. Ooh, but I, I'm I worried have, about the committee. I do have a concern um, that kind of follows his line of thought, which is the when, you, when you're saying a physician assistant authorized to prescribe, I'm sorry, on line 156, a physician assistant authorized to prescribe controlled substances under an approved job description or an advanced practice registered nurse authorized to prescribe pursuant to a physician protocol being on site, then so why would that preclude them from being able to be owners, owners as well? I understand the intent, but if they're able to control, prescribe the controlled substances with a physician protocol on site, what would preclude them from being able to have ownership just like a physician? Well, Representative Robin, you want me to answer that one for you? Yes, ma'am. Representative Kaiser, uh, physicians' assistants and nurse practitioners cannot own, uh, cannot prescribe class two drugs. However, the lobbyists for them, in being overly cautious, said that they're, you know, we have this 50% rule if you're a physician and you're just doing internal medicine, but 50% of your stuff is with pain, suggested that there might be some places outside where maybe they had given, the owner of the medical practice had given a 
nurse practitioner or physician assistant one percent or five percent of the corporation and that's why the exclusion is in there it's more for at the ones it's a grandfathering in it would be a very rare practice that that would happen but they were just trying to grandfather it in in case it had and, and it may if I may add to that madam chair the it, it is um, it's an inappropriate relationship for a physician to be taking orders from someone who's not a physician. And the reason for that is they haven't had the training that a physician's had. And if it's kind of getting, it's, it's the tail wagging the dog is what is also an issue that comes up in that, that area. And I, uh, that's one of the things that we don't want to see happening here. Because if we allow other, the, the more, the broader the ownership of this is, the more problematic it's going to be as far as keeping pill mills out of Georgia. Okay, you got it? Because, in other words, you could have, if you don't put that in that, you could have some PA. <laughs> Who is this? You could have some PA or, or nurse practitioner that can't order twos. Then they could set one of these up, own most of it, and then hire or give a physician 49%, and they would be running it rather than the physician. That's what they're trying to uh, exclude. Representative Henson. Oh, good. You're about to miss your face. I just pass. Okay, Representative Harden. <laughs> Two more. Oh, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I didn't uh, realize I had mashed my button, but I, I would, since I've got the floor, like to thank you, uh, <laughs> Representative Weldon, <laughs> for, for bringing this bill. It's, thank uh, you. It, 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 I think it, you have worked hard on it, and you've got all the parties in it, and uh, I, I appreciate you doing that. Thanks, sir. Appreciate okay. it. <laughs> thank you, Representative Harden. Representative Kidd. If I could maybe clarify a couple of things uh, with Mr. Weldon. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. I don't have the law books in front of me, but I believe the law says that it is illegal for the corporate practice of medicine uh, to do just what you were saying, having someone mm -hmm. other than a medical practitioner dictate to a physician what he has to do. That's in the law that it's illegal to have the corporate practice of medicine. And there's also another part of the statute that says a physician cannot self uh, refer and so if the physician has a private practice over here and a clinic over here depending on what the ratio is he can't self refer to himself that's also part of the statute if that helps clear up some of those questions Mr. Wilton I'm very much supporting you I think Bill. it does thank you thank you Representative Kitt okay we're I see no further questions we're on to um, oh I'm sorry Representative Beverly just have a quick question uh, and it's, it's to uh, Representative uh, uh, Rinder's point, and that is I have a uh, close personal friend who's a neurologist. He owns two pain management clinics in uh, middle Georgia, mm -hmm. and his wife is an optometrist. If, God forbid, something would happen to him and he passed, the practice, his ownership in that place would not then be able to be transferred to his wife. Um, so I understand a thug piece, and I'm with you there. You got me. Sure. Uh, but how do you transfer property rights in the event that a physician passes and his widow or her widow uh, it remains? And is that a part of the scope of this bill, and is it something that we can do to mitigate that? I think that is within the scope of this bill. And I think the way that that's going to be dealt with is will we'll be dealt with by the board, the Medical Composite Board, dealing with rules for secession. And I, I, and I can't answer your question on how it would be dealt with, but I think that they could, uh, if they, as long as they had, and they complied with the, the medical composite board's rules, then they could have a stopgap in there where they could get another physician to see the patients, prepare it, and in accordance with the board rules, they could deal with it. And that's what this is specifically authorizing the board to do. Rep Representative Les, that's Haskar, Attorney General on that issue. If you would come front, come forward. I think. 
Thank you for bringing that issue up, Reverend P. Beverly. I don't think that's a good one. And it may be something that, huh? Yes, it takes two seconds. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, the question I have, Attorney General, is, is that something we need to look at as this bill goes forward? Candidly, that's the same situation you have whenever a doctor passes away and you need to transfer the assets. So it's, it's, it's a, a situation that occurs whenever there's a death. You, you, you know, if, when a doctor passes in general, there needs to be a transfer of ownership for that practice to continue a sale. A, a transfer to, in this case, to another physician? Right. And I, and I, I might suggest, if, if possible, and, and I greatly thank Representative Weldon and, and of course, yourself for, for greatly assisting, the request uh, Representative Rinders, uh, Rinders for them to solely be medical are, is, frankly, the request of the medical board. And the reason that exists is because if you look to Florida, where the problem's been the worst in the country, it just so happens that the locations that were not owned by doctors were the worst offenders and the thugs that Representative Weldon is talking about. So we're trying to use that experience to not have that problem in the state. So, so what, you're, what you just said is your opinion that it's not necessarily a matter of statute, but because of what happened in Florida. And, and, and I get that because we don't want the tail wagging the dog, the point that was made earlier. If you had 60% of people who were non-physicians owning a clinic, then the tail could wag the dog. But I am concerned about me just being a private citizen, being able to freely invest in this country. Is there anything that, 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 that you're telling me by law that just the board would keep me from doing that, but there's nothing in law that should keep me from doing it? You know, I'd, you've got a doctor on your committee, and, and you've got doctors in this audience, and I'd feel more comfortable with them answering that question. But, I mean, the problem is sufficiently advanced that I'd rather err on the side of safety knowing what happened in Florida and knowing the pressure in Georgia okay. due to what happened in Florida. I, I will suggest just incidental, anecdotally, DEA just came out with a report last week that has shown a 97% a reduction in Florida of the drugs that were coming from the pill mills in less than a year. So it does work and it is a big safety issue. Thank you. Okay, uh, wait a minute. Uh, Attorney General, Representative Watson was your question for the Attorney General? Well, it was, it, it, it did address that. It, uh, from my perspective, and when a, when a physician dies, it, you know, it goes to his estate, and then his wife would dispose of his estate by selling it to another pain medicine uh, physician, and, and that's generally the way the, uh, the lineage or the, the practice is managed from that standpoint. So she wouldn't be deprived of her, uh, income. you know, the income from that or the sale of the practice. And, and the, the other issue is that you got to remember we're, we are singling out one specialty. It is a pain clinic, you know, that we're singling out, you know, from your perspective. And, and I, I understand your point, but I, I also, I mean, because, you know, as a physician, you're right. I mean, we, we do practice medicine, take care of patients, but we do have to earn a living, too. I mean, I, so I would certainly be sensitive to that from that perspective. Having said that, a general comment, I, I have worked with Representative Welton Cooper. And we did have a room of about... I counted them. I had my aide count them. We were 38 people in that room for two and a half hours. And, and I do think this is a good bill, and I congratulate uh, uh, everyone on this. I mean, I think, we sh uh, I think we've worked hard on this. Okay. Representative Henson, is your question for the Attorney General? Okay, it's been answered. Thank you. Okay, seeing no further questions. Uh, huh? Okay, let's go to the amendments. And you have copies of the amendments? Okay. These are amendments that were worked out in the hall, and, and okay, yeah, right, and okay. So you want to go with the, the yeah. amendments, and we've got I'll people. All right, Representative Chokas. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'd like to uh, uh, move that we uh, insert amendment um, at lines 221 that. Uh, it should read as follows. Law enforcement officers, coroners, county medical examiners, and the Georgia Bureau of Investigation Medical Examiner's Office who are investigating deaths related to prescription drug overdose are authorized to send pertinent records on such deaths to the Georgia Composite Medical Board. 
and that goes in on line 221. Yes, ma'am. Okay, in period. Okay, any discussion on that amendment? Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Okay, not uh, everyone in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. Okay, wait a minute. Legal counsel's got one. It's intended to be broader than that. Okay, it is intended to be broader. Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, any discussion since we know it's intended to be broader? And I, I think that would relate to some maybe of the reporting of we have had a OBGYN, am I right, who was doing plastic surgery in his office without anesthesia and the, and the patient died and other deaths like people uh, practicing out their scope. Okay, Representative Harden. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I wonder if uh, because they run into this uh, frequently too, if we might include Georgia Drugs and Narcotics Agency. Is that okay? Okay, that's fine. Thank we have a motion to amend the amendment. Uh, Betsy, where we put it, good. Are, are we saying that they would also send the records to the composite boards? Is that what it was? Or we're saying that they would get the records that were sent? Send the records. No, send the records. Send the records, okay. Um, then we probably add it after the county medical examiner saying that there was a drug in our body. Do our body say something? Well, then. the Georgia Composite Medical Board and the Georgia Pharmacy Board. No, not the Pharmacy Board. Uh, Georgia Drugs and Narcotics. No, Georgia Drugs and Narcotics. We're sending to those two. No. no. We're not. No, these are just things going to the Composite Medical Board. Okay, I got you. Okay. 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 So the amendments st stand as amended. The amendment stands as amended. Is it okay that Betsy makes it correct in legalese to where it fits that the fact that the, what do you call them? Buddy? Georgia, Drug Georgia Drugs and Narcotic can also send records to the Composite Medical Board. Anybody opposed to that? Okay, no. All right, Second Amendment, go ahead. Right. Chuckus, you've got it. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to offer a Second Amendment to, uh, the this will be to House Bill 972 LC 334668S substitute. Uh, and on line 94, where it says in patients, we need to insert the word patients. Delete the word in patients and insert the word patients. Okay, so we got. Huh? Okay, kid, we have a and motion and a second. Do we have any discussion on the amendment? Uh, hearing no discussion, everyone in favor of the amendment? Say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? No. And Number. the third amendment. Third, third amendment. Also on the same LC number, LC 334668, substitute S for House Bill 972. Also on line 94, uh, after yeah. the word home, in a nursing home licensed home, instead of home, we put the word home health agency or hospice. Got a second, motion and a second, yes. Madam Chair. Okay. 
as I, as I understand the gentleman's amendment, it would then read on page, on, on line 94, that our patients, as amended earlier, in a nursing home, home health agency or hospice. Correct. That's it, yep. Nursing home, home, home health yeah, agency. Yeah, I, I just, I think, Betsy, that's not legally it's correct. Comma. Home, home. It would be nursing home, comma. Right, right. Okay, we have the addition of a comma. Yes. Any yeah. other, oh, Representative Watson. Yeah. I just want to make sure that we're including, remember in our discussion that we were making sure that hospice, which, you know, hospice houses, 5% are the population and 95% are outpatient at home or walking around. Does saying just hospice include that, include that 95% in hospice? Because we certainly do not want to include any population of hospice in this. It, I believe that if with the amended, with the amendment, I believe that'll take care of okay. the home care. Betsy, are we 100% are we sure on that? I'm sorry. Uh, the, just the, it, when we say home health care, home health agency or hospice, does that going to include outpatient hospice patients? Because my concern is inpatient hospice houses versus those 95% that are outpatient. Th that's in that. Great, thank you. Okay, and before we vote, Representative Weldon didn't wasn't uh, Betsy brought it up that hospitals were originally in this and it's they're not there now. Or were they supposed? Is that an omission that? And and this is on line ninety four. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yes, okay. ma'am. It is because on uh, on the definition in the definition of uh, pain management clinic on line one thirteen, this shall not include any clinic or practice owned in whole or in part operated by a hospital. <laughs> license pursuant to Chapter 7 of Title 31, and I think that takes hospitals out. Okay, Representative Pack. No way. Okay. Uh, what? Representative Henson. What is a home health agency? Okay. Re Representative Kidd. In another life, I used to represent the home health agency. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, but then they kind of went out of business because there were some crooks in there. Uh, if you might remember, they serve federal time. But that's an agency that uh, is called to come into your home, uh, uh, do infusion therapy, uh, and this type of stuff. Uh, it's like a, uh, a private duty nurse that comes into your home for a couple hours and leaves. That's what I thought. Now, here's my question. How can you be a patient in a home health agency? That's what I thought. So we are adding, after the words home, we're putting the, if, how is this going to read, but you'll not include pers persons that are patients in a nursing home, comma, home health agency or hospice, is that correct? Yep, correct. <coughs> it's almost like you're having them in the home health agency also. <laughs> You're not, you're not using the word inpatient anymore. You've struck in the word in, so it just refers to patients. I see what she's well, it makes it sound like you're physically there. Yeah. Okay, we have the amendment. If the amendment passes, will it be okay to let Betsy make sure that that is correct as far as legalese? Anybody have a problem? Okay, we have the amendment. There's no further discussion. Everyone in favor of the amendment? Say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Okay. And Representative Weldon, didn't you have another one changing may to shall that you may have forgotten? Yes, ma'am, I sure did. This is. Um, okay. And I'll make it for you. Go ahead and state okay. it, and I'll make, and it'll be. A may to a shall. A yes. shall to a may. A shall to a may. <laughs> on line uh, 164 on page 5. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it reads, if you begin at the first of, that li uh, of line 164, it says, to this article shall be denied. And uh, if we take that shall on line 164 and change that to may. Any discussion? No discussion. Everyone, in, do we have a motion? I'm, I make the motion for that. Anyway, do I have a second? Second. Who? 
Oh, Representative Rogers, you get, look, Since that may is affects number one, two, three, and four, I just want to make sure that I understand. Are, are we saying that they can still grant a license there, Madam Chair, if they've been convicted of a crime? That's number two on the next page. They could still grant it. May. It the, gives the board the... It, that's exactly right. It gives the board the discretion to look at what the crime was. And, and here's the issue there. Let's say you have okay. several doctors. Let's say you have four in a practice, and they own the practice, and they have several pain management clinics. One of them gets, into a, gets convicted of a felony. The other three have done everything right. They shouldn't be penalized. Un, you know, while because they're time, but that thug in Florida now you got a uh, convict and I still can't buy in. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that what you're telling me? <laughs> you, you got the well, gangster in Florida, you got the doctor accused somewhere else, but me and the lady chair can't buy in. Well, there's this nice little yeah. protocol yeah. called medical school, medical school to get yeah. you right yeah. in that program. An amendment that will allow only Representative Reiner's <laughs> to <laughs> also have exception. part ownership at a pain <laughs> clinic. <laughs> Okay, I have, a, I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Okay, hearing no further discussion, uh, everyone in favor of the amendment? Anyone opposed? No? Okay, that amendment passes. Okay, we are in the posture of... Okay. Okay. Uh, the passage, okay, of substitute House Bill 972 as amended. I've got a move and a sec, and uh, Representative, well, yeah. Representative Chope has wanted to make that. I wanted uh, to make the motion if that's okay, Madam Chair. Okay, <laughs> he'll second it. Any discussion? No. Hearing discussion, everyone in favor of the passage of uh, House Bill 972 as amended, say aye. Aye. Uh, everyone opposed, say no. And don't go away. Okay, Reiner, you got it. Okay. Th thank you. Thank you very much. Am I adjourning, Madam Chair? No. Oh. Where is it? Cut me off. This. We'll get that straight. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Okay, Ed. Ed. <laughs> Representative Reinders, Chair, Mr. J I am ready. Yes. I'd like to call the attention of the committee to the most uh, perhaps influential bill in the history of the Georgia General Assembly that is about to be presented by perhaps the most powerful person in the history of the Health and Human Services Committee. I don't even know why we're hearing the bill and not passing it automatically, but I do present to you, Madam Chairwoman, House Ms. Bill. Cooper. How, this is House Bill. Appreciate 11. you writing that introduction for me. Thank you. <laughs> House Bill, I bring to you House Bill 1143. We have just required the Composite Board of Medical Examiners to do something that they've never done, and that is license uh, these pain clinics. And they have no funding, so I hope that everybody on appropriations will also ask for funding for this. It is a big undertaking. So they have one small request, and since we have given them a big job, I hope we can pass this one small request for them. They now license orthodontist and prosthesis. Okay, can't even say it. I think those are the people that make limbs. All right. And by law, they require other people that they license to have 40 hours of continuing education. They have been requiring 30 hours, but the Attorney General's office has ruled that they have to follow the 40-hour rule, and they would like the discretion to be able to decide how many hours these people that make prosthesis have to have and that's what the bill does it allows them to make that decision since it's not as quite an important for these people to have a continuing education is perhaps for a physician or a PA and that's what the bill does all right any questions for madam chairwoman representative second any questions all right we got a movement and a second any discussion 
All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed? Thank you, Carl. Very where are you going? Bill ain't passed yet. <laughs> Bill passes. Thank and you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And we will have a meeting on Wednesday, but it will not last long.